Sam wird sein auch und tut sich denn. Und oder man de facto zack nicht trug in such nor, nicht zu uns nie bei Rodrin Hukti, Sangin, Sören, Tilödich, Roberto, Benesarts, Bena. Good evening. Good evening, Jargon. Welcome to the show. And before we start a lot of things to talk about UNICEF in Mongolia, <coughs> I would like to ask some questions about the current situation we face in terms of this missile. Sure. sure. What happened? Why is that? Sure. Indeed, it is, it is a concern. It is not uh, a new um, issue in the country. I, you know, we had last year in March, so we had the first uh, outbreak uh, that we successfully tackled and, and UNICEF provided uh, an important support to the government. However, measles is a highly infective disease and although Mongolia was certified as a measles free country, only in 2015 we had 15 countries that had major outbreaks. So it is a recurrent, it should not be, it also called to be uh, focused and not to have any complacency when it comes to such an important disease. So we are following the situation very closely. There is a response in place, but we need to be sure that the system is prepared. It is about preparedness. It is about ensuring that uh, we keep our system ready to respond. And it turned out we are not ready for that. And uh, before we go that, where is it coming from? Uh, what is that disease about? Why is it that dangerous and so, so kind? So much it can just uh, uh, go around. Well, it's one of the <coughs> most infective diseases. And again, it follows population. It is mobile as populations are mobile. And what we know is that it is coming from, uh, from the out outside. It's coming from populations that are crossing borders. Neighboring countries of Mongolia had major outbreak in 2015. And this is a, is a big country. And the, and the border is, is extensive, is massive, as you know. So the, the problem is that uh, we need to ensure that our systems are not complacent, are ready to respond uh, to missiles uh, in, uh, in a rapid time. So this is why uh, there has been a response, there has been also a, a support that was provided by WHO, by UNICEF itself, uh, and, but we need to learn lessons. It is all about improving system and learning lessons. How to make sure that, now uh, uh, first I understand it's go it goes down now. Yes, yes. Can we say that we stopped it? No, it is, uh, it is still uh, slowly ongoing. Most important point, there are what we call supplementary immunization activity, SIAs that are being planned uh, and, already, and already vaccines on the way. We are very helped to say that we help uh, Ministry of Health to procure vaccine from our procurement channels, from UNICEF, to ensure that they're coming safe and then coming rapidly. So already beginning of May, very beginning of May, there will be a stock vaccine ready for what we call a supplementary immunization. So it is it still coming? It is on the way, yes. It was requested uh -huh. and it is, uh, the shipment will arrive at the beginning of May, yes. Uh, why we don't have a reserve? Well, th this is also an important point. There are, um, and, I'm, and I'm referring especially to the child-related uh, population that is extremely vulnerable to measles. There are reserves for what is called the routine immunizations. But the routine immunization also does not cover children that are under five months of age. So there are certain uh, exposure and vulnerabilities that are normal, and what is important is to have stocks available for, for supplementary immunization um, uh, activities. This is not always the case. It's not always the case in a country to have that available. It should be, especially countries that are ahead in the, in the income. So the lesson level. is, after uh, come down, uh, came in making down this uh, break, uh, we should make sure that we have that optimal reserve in the country so that we don't pay that much with that much death of uh, small little children for this unpreparedness. This is one of the lessons, Jargal. I would say preparedness is the key. The other lessons is also preparedness is not only the physical stock, preparedness is also capacity of staff. This is why we invested efforts in training um, staff. For many years, uh, Mongolia was measles free. So it's normal that there is a certain level of preparedness that has to be boosted, that has to be uh, muscled up. And we are working on that. The other level of preparedness is also communication to families, being able to detect the systems, the symptoms, being able to 
uh, prevent, because measles can also be, be prevented. So what is important is to work on preparedness on the largest spectrum. It's not only about the physical availability of the vaccine. It's also a, probably a awareness or knowledge of uh, mothers. Correct. What could happen, and even it may happen until uh, nine years, ni nine months old. Correct. We were expecting after nine years, of, uh, nine month old, mm -hmm. but now it's happening with five Correct. months old. Correct. And we, you know, for this, uh, from this irresponsible, I would say, preparedness, we've had already by the death of over 60 small uh, children, is, which is very pity. All right. Um, can I call Roberto, right? Of course. Roberto, uh, let's talk about UNICEF. UNICEF in Mongolia, you have been already a one and a half a year, right? Yes, here. yes, so more than that, yes. What are changes? Well, first of all, Jargal, um, fantastic experience. Mongolia <coughs> is truly one of the countries, one of a kind. And I knew it before arriving and that was confirmed after more than a year and a half because of the, the overwhelming uh, uh, beauty of its nature, but also the power of identity the culture, the potential. If there is one thing that I learned throughout my stay in Mongolia is potential. The, 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 the capacity in people, not only in the natural resources that are well known, but also in people to look at the future with optimism. A and this is, I, this is one of the things that I learned by, by, by being here in Mongolia is also the resilience of population that comes from very extreme also weather conditions. And this gives an incredible force to a young population. A third of Mongolians mm -hmm. are, are young, 36% under the age of 25. Can you imagine the potential to walk to the future with optimism? And this is one of the things that motivates me uh, also to, to, to be happy as a person in this country. Well, yeah, one third under <coughs> 25, a half under 30. These statistics are really impressive. And it also requires a lot of responsibility. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's young people. Indeed. And the segment of population that your organization dealing with is uh, about, about this age and uh, UNICEF mostly, you know, uh, we regard in Mongolia as one of the drivers of taking uh, issues addressed related to youth. How far, I mean, so far, what do you think? How much you are dealing with these issues and where are the weak points the country has to pay attention? Mm -hmm. You know, we are at the, at the critical junction mm. also in, uh, in the development journey of the country where there are critical opportunities to be seized, but also there are risks if those opportunities are not uh, properly, properly met and intercepted. Let me tell you that as UNICEF, we acknowledge the tremendous progress that Mongolia has made on children. We need to start from there. If we take 1990, 2016, tremendous progress. One of the best performing countries in cutting down the number of children who died before the age of five, almost five times. Cutting down the, the nutrition, the stunting status of many children. Five times the children mortality has, has decreased, decreased for 25 years. That is correct. Jarrah. And which made the longevity of Mongolians, life expectancy, growth, grown up for another nine or seven years older. Because this statistics probably well, we need to see then about the mortality causes in, in, in adult age. Mm -hmm. My point is that uh, there is a progress to be acknowledged on, on across the, the areas, child survival, education, getting children in school, nutritional status has improved dramatically, preschool has increased. Where I see the importance now to switch the attention is on narrowing the inequality that are still preventing the country to unlock its potential. And inequality, we all know from ECD, OECD research and all countries' experience, are a break to economic growth, are well, a break to development. That's, I think, particular segment of problems we face, you addressed as inequality in terms of family incomes, the children, how much they eat, even what is the nutrition level. And in that sense, what are the alarming issues uh, with this understanding in terms of inequality, in particular for children? I would choose, if I look at data, I would choose no doubt uh, access to um, safe drinking water and uh, proper sanitation. If we look at the average, this is an area that as a country we need to do better. 
uh, still uh, uh, less than 60% of the population as a, as a national average has access to proper sanitation and slightly more than 60%, 64% to safe drinking water. And then if we unpack those national average into the gap between rural and urban, urban, peri-urban, rich and poor families, this gap is even wider. So this is an area where it is important that we invest energies, financial resources, but also the, the decision making uh, courage to have that uh, as top priority on the development agenda. Because we know what to do, yeah. solutions are there. Indeed, the issues of having 36% of people having not access to drinking water, clear <coughs> drinking water, and 40% having no proper sanitation, really is alarm alarming. And I keep writing about that, trying to draw attention of the public to that issue. And uh, I was impressed uh, with the way you have been doing the pilot project that gives some idea for Mongolians that it is possible in a cost-efficient way to solve part of the problems. Please tell us about sure. what you have been doing on that project. This is very much the way we operate. We not only support uh, um, government institutions and, and agencies and ministries providing technical assistance, but also we try to identify successful models of service delivery at the local level, in particular in Huskul Aymak and in Nalak uh, district. We test those models, uh, we try to evaluate them, learn lessons and propose them for, for wide nationwide replication. And when it comes to, to uh, sanitation, which is a crucial service for children because it's part of the overall well-being and their health, uh, we saw uh, successful indicators improvement in the use of what we call the, the wash uh, container unit, which is uh, um, a container that is uh, fitted as a sanitation unit and attached to either the mobile kindergartens, that is another model that we are testing, especially in rural areas, or attached to school buildings that don't have indoor sanitation. And that is uh, an innovation that brings the cost quite low in terms of installation. It has an immediate impact in better health and hygiene for children, better well-being. Parents are happy because children can have proper sanitation in the kindergarten garden and school. Now our strategy is to move to replication in more IMAX, replication on larger geographical Indeed, scale. I have visited uh, your facility in Hupsugul IMAX and I was impressed with this uh, wash container facility that uh, you, have, you have built into the current dorms building right. and the kids were so happy because they have finally inside indoor facilities and shower and uh, restrooms. That was very impressive. Uh, in particular, if you consider the cost, that is so much you can solve. I think if from the particular IMAC as someone, a Mongolian private company. Just make this one instead of making big nadam or spending a hell of money for just making show, showing up. I would rather ask them to do the same things, which is in which, which someone's? It is in Tung, Tungilsom, right? Yes, yes, that's where you yeah, visit. This is the visit. And also that uh, kindergarten where small kids have on this wash facilities. Yes. It's very impressive. In Ger district in Nalech, where the, mostly the Kazakh population lives, that is impressive. So, I mean, you have been organizing a certain kind of training of other IMAX yes. kindergartens, yes. right? Yes, a how sharing of experiences. How is yes. it going now? It's going well because we see ownership and leadership at IMAC level mm -hmm. from, uh, from government uh, department and authorities. And this is the most important result for us, to leave behind in the area where we operate uh, a seed of uh, knowledge and leadership and ownership of our, of our approach. And this is very much sustainable now in the sense that the IMAC uh, uh, governor cabinet or the NALAC also uh, district and governor team, they are animating themselves this, uh, this dialogue across IMAC and across districts. And recently in Who School in Murun, we had a number of representatives from other IMACs that travel to see directly this type of installation. Now, this uh, dialogue that uh, generates new idea, new commitment, is what we really want to, to support, and we see it growing. The whole business model is to start to show, to start in particular locations, to show 
that it is working. Yes. Then the other people come and they're replicating it all around. Right? That is working, that is making good results, that is affordable, that's and is also that's easy fantastic. to maintain because that's it's also maintenance over time. That's the whole thing. And, uh, that's the solution to that problem of uh, unaccessible water, drinking water in the wash facilities. Um, also, I remember you have organized air pollution and its impact yes. on children. Yes, recently. Please tell us about that. You're right, uh, Jargal. In, in uh, January, uh, together with the Public Health Institute, we brought here to Lambator some of the top uh, world experts in air pollution, and that followed an analysis that we made here in Mongolia to try to understand the impact on child health. So findings were presented and we also tried to use that conference as an opportunity to position air pollution and child health uh, to the attention of the public uh, and the decision makers. The findings are staggering. If we look at the, uh, the three top uh, mortality causes, the causes that, 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 that led to the highest number of years of life that are lost, those three causes are related to air pollution. It's ischemic disease, uh, respiratory That's disease, pit, it? lung cancer. It's like this situation in London in the 50s where they had uh, the similar statistics of people dying because of the bad air. And, and it is, and it is uh, scientifically proven. What is important is that there is a lot of also leadership from, uh, from government uh, ministries also to work on solutions. There are plans that now needs to be accelerated. Our concern, Jargal, is to cut down on what is the exposure of children to air pollution, but also, and may, let me also use this opportunity to send an appeal, indoor smoking. Indoor smoking is, a, is an accelerating factor of uh, pneumonia, of P child lung vulnerability. Uh -huh. Not only the air pollution that it caused, we know by the raw coal burning, but also that is also coupled with the fact that inside the house, inside the girl, Smoking is harming children, and the family lives together in a very condensed space. We need to cut down on that. We need to ensure the children in Gare district, in particular, in the north of the city, in a, uh, in Gare, if father or uh, a member of family smokes, it makes this situation even worse. Exactly, yes. it's an accelerating factor. And yes. I hope after that, I remember there was certain advices. Uh, how to combat this situation, etc. And I, I hope our government will do that. And also, along with this uh, UNICEF, what you do, your function about what we have talked, also you have been uh, also advocating uh, the children's uh, right. Yes. So what is that about? <coughs> this gives me the opportunity also to, to say how happy we are that uh, the new child protection law uh -huh. was recently <laughs> adopted at the parliament. And this is expression of commitment not to be taken for granted. The government of Mongolia has made a tremendous step ahead uh, in adopting a very forward-looking and modern law that bans corporal punishment on all settings. It's a law that looks into protecting children when they are online. This is a country with a young population hyper-connected. All our children and adolescents with their smartphone, with access to internet, are also exposed to opportunities but also risks. So the laws also look into that and also looks into creating a system of protection of rights. Mm -hmm. So I'm very, I'm very proud also to say that our government partner, the different uh, uh, authorities and National Authority for Children and others involved in this have worked together with parliamentarians. So we have a law. A very strong and How many law. countries do they have the law? Well, most of countries, uh, most developed countries, they have a law and Mongolia is joining Mongolia had already, let me clarify, they had already a law. This law is, uh, is a newer, more advanced in its contents and also adapted mm -hmm. to a changed world. So what is important is that uh, Mongolia joins a group of countries that have a law, mm. but also a law that is uh, matching a world that is changing fast. So like uh, many Mongolian laws, we have not only to make those laws, but also to enforce them, to make sure that, in, and for that, it is not only the officials' work or government work, it's also a knowledge of parents, everybody, every citizen, that every child is protected by a law, and you cannot offend, yes. you cannot beat, you cannot restrict, the, limit the rights of the children, right? And how, what can we do better? What can we do uh, that the parents know about that more? 
there is a work that goes beyond uh, the technical implementation of the law. It's a work of changing public opinion mm -hmm. on ensuring that the rights of children are known and considered as uh, as a non-negotiable part of our life. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the rights of the most vulnerable in the society. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to violence and corporal punishment against children, when it comes to verbal abuse, when it comes to discrimination, we need to create a culture where children are protected, not just because it is right and it is part of the human rights culture, but also because we build the foundation of a healthy society, Absolutely. of a strong, cohesive society. And plus we have uh, certain uh, phones that children can call if yes. they are being beaten or offended, yes. right? It's the 108 number uh -huh. that was set up uh, a couple of years ago uh, with the support of UNICEF and other organizations and led by the National Authority for Children. Now, today, children have a free toll number to call, not only to report a case, but also interact and ask for counseling. If Meaning there is that any the operators advice, are, exactly, the operators if they are feel trained. uncomfortable or that something is isolated or beaten, they can call. To that this is phone. correct. And this phone is a free. Who is it's operating free. it? The National Authority for Children. Okay, so the all two uh, 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 phone, uh, cell phone operating companies. Exactly, are they provide. So. They provide the support. We need to yeah. acknowledge that. Yes, but it's not so bad, isn't it? Well, this Could is a huge. It's right? a huge step ahead, Jagat, because it also breaks the isolation of a child that has uh, witnessed or that has lived himself herself violence and abuse. Yes, it's it a is. great step ahead. Uh, let's talk back about uh, your institutions. And I understand as UN institutions, it is working with the government, with contract, and with a certain priority for any five years. And I understand you guys are going to make a either new one yes. now, and uh, th so next for the next five years. I mean, it is now uh, happening with your tenure here. What would be those priorities for the next coming five years? Indeed, we just uh, finalized uh, the preparation of the new program 2017-2021. Mm. Two main uh, areas of focus. One is an accelerated push to narrow those inequality gaps that we still have there in access to water, in access to sanitation, in access to quality preschool, in ensuring education for children with disabilities. Those, all those areas where we still do not have quality coverage of service. Mm -hmm. Give a push to close those gaps. But also ensuring that we can support the government in having children as an area of social investment. Investing in the new generation is the best way to create that human capital that will sustain economic growth. I remember my article I was doing with your professionals in the field that how important it is to feed the children before three years old yes. with the right yes. required vitamins. Then Correct. you have grown so much in this investment is several, uh, several, several dozen times a folded uh, return it gives. I remember that. Um, if you would uh, have a chance to talk to all of Mongolian government and to tell just one message about ch children in Mongolia, what would be that message? The message would be very clear. Investing in children, adolescents, the new generation as a fundamental condition to create that human capital that mm -hmm. the country needs uh, to sustain economic growth, mm -hmm. to look at the future and a prosperous future with optimism. And investing in the new generation, getting mm -hmm. children to school with quality education, getting them healthy and protect it. That's the best way to create the foundation for tomorrow's. Roberto, a few questions about you. Uh, you. You are an Italian. You have been working for UNICEF for over how many, 15 years? All 18 almost. Oh, 18 years, and you have been working big countries, Mexico, Yemen, Senegal, and now in Mongolia, smaller country. Uh, what is that strikes you working with UNICEF? The capacity of uh, create change. Change. We are in the business of change, of social change. That capacity of helping the population, the society that we serve through our partner governments, through our partner in the civil society to create change, to ensure that we manage th to help those children, not only for today, but as a condition to ensure prosperity of the children and the society correct. in the future. If you change the children today, you will change the future. That is correct. This is what we believe in. Why you have decided to work with children? What made you? 
I would say that it was always something that I, that I felt inside since uh, an adolescence. I was part of uh, uh, community groups, uh, the Scouts. I spent many years in the Scouts in Italy. I was uh, experiencing volunteering myself. So since the age where you really develop your passions, I believe that uh, there was a connection with other peers and there was a connection with the young groups. And I immediately saw that that was the best way to, to change society for the better. This is why then I studied diplomacy and international relations and I subsequently entered UNICEF. What are the most important features in character to do what you are doing? You need to believe that uh, society can evolve uh, positively and you need to be driven by a sense of optimism despite the difficulties that you see every day in this world but also focus on the fact that uh, it's one of the best way to use the time we have available it's one of the best way to spend uh, this life in a useful manner what uh, days look like where you feel very happy working with what you do the days they I feel most happy are the days where I feel uh, our partners, those that we work long with, that uh, start talking a language or doing things that perhaps uh, they were not very familiar with. And they start picking up and taking over the messages that we're trying to, to support, the capacity that we're trying to share, and see that this virtuous, positive dynamics is self-sustained. That gives me a sense of peace, that gives me a sense of... Uh, of fulfillment and, and, and ultimately is the reason why, why we do what we do. So were the, those feelings where you had uh, uh, when you worked during the Aceh in Indonesia, big tsunami and earthquake disaster, yeah. right? That was probably the most intense experience in, in all my life uh, where those feelings were magnified by the size of the disaster. Um, yes, absolutely. And then you will see the true value of life. Yes. Great. Roberta, what you do here are very important for us, as we tell for the future of Mongolia, because you do something that otherwise hard or not always we will find to do so because other pressures. So we want to have this healthy children, you know, well-being, very children, very important. So. You and your team in Mongolia, I saw your great Mongolian team you have, and uh, in fact, the uh, UN has a lot of Mongolians, professionals Absolutely. working. And uh, what you do is really a part of better, better Mongolia. So I would like to thank you and your team for a wonderful job, and good luck, my friend. Thank you so much, Agal, for having me, and also for all the great work that these uh, valuable Mongolians are doing every day for, for their own country, and we want to support them. Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.